everybody. We are back once again for episode three, the final episode of Captain's Call. I am joined for the last time by the captain, Sergio Parise, Chris Robshaw, and journalist James Weil. This podcast is brought to you by eToro, the official investing and trading partner of Premiership Rugby. Tackle investing the smart way and join millions of UK investors on eToro today, the friendly platform for serious investors, eToro. As a multi-asset investment platform, the value of your investments may go up or down. Your capital is at risk. Sergio, I want to start with you. How are you, man? And how is the mood in France after they went out in the quarterfinals? Is it a little down? <laughs> yeah, very down. Uh, Look, uh, yeah, to be honest, a lot of a lot of frustration for fans, uh, obviously. The team, the the players, and everyone. Wow, what a lot of expectation on on the French team, and uh, yeah. And when you see the the game against the Springboks, I think they, you know, they felt they they, they were in the game. They dominate. They they, they had good moments, and uh, you know, the Springboks were really clinical. And uh, you know, uh, as French, uh, the French press, uh, the supporters, they for, for all the French people here is just. The fault of uh, the referee, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's just all blame on him, uh, which importantly for him was, yeah, no, an easy game to to referee. You know, uh, was a game winning by one point. Uh, a lot of decision, uh, difficult decision to to make. But yeah, the atmosphere in France was a little quiet in this uh, this these days, and uh, yeah, frustration for the team. And uh, you know, it's the World Cup still going. Uh, we saw uh, we saw after after the game against. Um, Against South Africa, South Africa play against England uh, last night. They play a, a good, a very good game. Sorry, England play a very good game, and and, and the spring of finally they they won, which is again uh, another really close game. Uh, so you know the the World Cup still going, uh, and I think that well, from the French point of view, there's less interest now probably because France is not involved anymore. So they just continue to ask in a little bit how how is possible just to lose that game against uh, South Africa. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense if the host is going to go out that maybe the mood will die down a bit. But I did hear the French yeah. fans singing La Marseillaise at uh, at least one of the semifinals. So I guess the hardcore fans are still involved. Chris, yeah. man, how about over in England? Obviously, your heart is probably <clears throat> still pounding after that, uh, that second semi. Yes, absolutely devastating. I was lucky to, lucky enough to be in the Stade de France um, where the atmosphere was absolutely amazing. The conditions were pretty horrendous, actually for the teams playing but it really suited the way England wanted to play um, they they caught South Africa the game plan was perfect and they, they caught them cold I think South Africa had a bit of a, a slow start on the back of them last week but I th you know what I thought we had done enough I thought England had got far enough ahead of them in those conditions the way South Africa were playing the way England were aggressive in defence playing in the right areas um but look, I think their bench was immense. Their bench, whether they called those guys a bomb squad or if that was a different group of people. And, and look, they made some big calls. Razzi made some big calls, didn't he? He took his 10 off after 30 minutes, which is a never a nice position to be, but of course it, it worked. He took Expert off, who never goes off. He took his captain, Dwayne Van Um There were some really big calls. And look, fair play for, for Pollard to step up in the 77th minute. 50 metres out in horrendous conditions, underfoot, the pressure of it all. It was a kick which unfortunately never looked like missing. But I got a Euro star back, back this, in the morning after. Um, and yeah, there were some very, very disappointed English fans, but also in, incredibly proud because pre tournament, when we lost three out of our four warm up games, no one gave us a chance to get to a semi final. Yeah. So. But then the other side is you get that close, you want to go a step further, don't you? So look, there's, there's of course, a huge amount of disappointment, um, but there's a huge amount of pride in what this England side has done. Were the conditions that bad? Because they looked bad on camera, but I feel like often the camera doesn't do it justice. Yeah. yeah. They so, were absolutely yeah. soaking. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes that's... Uh... Yeah, the camera doesn't pick up the full the full nature of it, but the ball seemed to be bouncing around like a bar of soap. Uh, James, you've got one game or two games left uh, to cover in your role as a journalist. Are you looking forward to the end of it so you don't have to keep making the trip across the channel or are you going to be sad that it's going to be gone? Well, I've got to say, on a very selfish level, 
um, I managed to find an Airbnb that's about 11 minutes walk from the media entrance to Stade de France for 39 euros a night. Now, how good is that? That's just absolutely <laughs> incredible. Now, it's not the um, it's not the most salubrious of places, I have to tell you that. But when you're getting about five hours sleep a night and the press conferences go until two o'clock in the morning, um, the mattress was comfortable. That's all I have to say. And that's the important thing. But yeah, look, um, I agree with Sergio that it did seem a little flatter. Um, just before we came on air, uh, we were discussing the atmosphere in both games. Uh, New Zealand, Argentina was pretty flat. Uh, England, South Africa was uh, a lot better. I think that, that was a lot, you know, there was a lot of Springbok fans there. There were a lot of uh, English fans there. Um, but any tournament that loses its host in the quarterfinals, uh, you're going to take a little bit of glitter and a little bit of gloss out of it. The, the frisson of it, you know, when you're in the cabs talking to the drivers, taking you wherever you're going, that's not quite there anymore. You know, the first time I got there, um, uh, you know, when I went over for the uh, last round of the pool stages, when the customs guy was checking my passport, he gave me a, a one minute tirade on the uh, on Anton Dupont's uh, faceplate, you know, and that was the sort of thing that was, that was pretty special moments at the cup. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's um, uh, we had it, I guess, at the last World Cup with Japan, but Japan in some uh, areas weren't even projected to get out of the pool. So the fact they made it to the quarters was already a pretty decent effort. With France, many were expecting them, Sergio, to go all the yeah. way to the final. They're still a pretty young squad. I mean, next World Cup, yeah. they're still going to be a force. Of course, yeah, there's a lot of frustration because actually it was was not even in their plan to just to, to get and stop in the current final. They just um I don't know, they just focus on the final. They every time you're talking about, you know, be there. Uh and of course they're still a young team. Uh most part of these players are gonna be there in Australia in in twenty twenty-seven. And uh yeah, for you know, but it's it's, it's a really uh, they miss a big chance. Uh, you never play. They don't gonna play these players. They don't gonna play another World Cup at home. And uh, when you see the amount of quality of this team and how they arrive in this World Cup, uh, playing a great Six Nation uh, with the best player in the world, with Antoine Dupont, made a um, huge effort to be there after his surgery and his sick bone. So it was. You know a lot of uh good things uh around the team and uh, especially when you saw the game against south africa which uh, i talked with uh charlo livon which uh, uh i coached him here in toulon and he told me sergio look we feel physically we feel we fell on the game we feel like we were better than them we feel like we dominate sometimes so actually the sensation of frustration watch was like they score twice uh, you know, we, we miss some up to a couple of up and unders. Uh, they, you know, they don't build like like 20, 30 faces for score. They tries and they 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 like to stay a little bit the French team. So actually, they can't you know uh, take these gaps, especially when Etzebe take a yellow card. You know, um, at the end of the first half, they have 10 minutes with France was plus six uh, on the scoreboard, and they they can't have this break. You know, so mentally, actually, South Africa still there with some chances and. You know, and after that, it's like, you know, uh, as, as the French team, like, they feel really, really, really frustrated about, you know, the, felt that they, they felt strong, stronger than, than South Africa, but actually they can, you know, have this gap uh, in the second half, which, you know, is, it is what it is. So this team and uh, Dupont and, and most part of this play, they're going to be there in Australia in four years' time. But, you know, the big frustration is, you know, uh, was work up at home and, uh, you know, uh, loss in the final was probably uh, another 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 history, but loss in the current final is like was a little bit like you no, know, that's uh, unacceptable for everyone uh, involved on on the French side. But you know, that's the sport, so uh, it's it's hurt for for the French point of view. It hurt a lot, but you know that is what that's the sport. Really. I, yeah, I, I think, think we've uh, sorry, I think we've whenever you play South Africa as well, the French exactly what Sergio was saying there and. And the English, I'm sure, were saying the same. You always think, how did we lose that game? Because yeah. often, like said, you said, they don't win by kind of four, uh, four tries or something like that. They just have an ability to find a way of winning. 
whether that's throwing back to their forward pack, whether that's squeezing teams, whether that's Pollard kicking a last minute penalty. And then you come out of the game and you think, we feel like they haven't done a lot, but they've beaten us still. Yeah. You feel like you're yeah. in the game the whole time, but it, they're yeah. such a hard team to get one over on. And I think with, yeah. with their experience, with, of course, they've won the last World Cup and um, they've been around the world and won some big games as well. I think when you get in those tight battles, you have that kind of mentality in the back of your head that someone's going to get us out of trouble. We, we've been in this situation before and and I think more than any other team in, in world rugby, I always find they're that team. I think, uh, Chris, Chris and Sergio, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple of things. There's, there's quite a lot of synergy between the two games, right? Um, but there's also one complete opposite. Uh, Sergio, I think I dropped you a text um, that France just simply forgot to defend. Um, you know, the, there were some really clumsy errors, not controlling the drop zone at the restart, yeah. Cameron Wokey reclaimed the restart. Where was the bloke controlling that drop zone? You know, basic rugby. If my if my boys playing in Midlands one did that, I'd give them a, a rollicking, you know? And at test level, it's unforgivable. And I think, um, um, I also think that while South Africa, uh, France kind of forgot to defend, I also think at times England forgot to attack yesterday. Mm. Although I, I take on board that they're an incredibly a uh, hard sight uh, to break down. Uh, there was a couple of times when um, we had the opportunity to keep the ball in hand to the corner. And it's that little, if I look back at every marginal moment in this World Cup that South Africa uh, have won, I'd have a spreadsheet this long. And I, I, I'm not joking, whether it be controlling the Elliot Daly knock on in the corner and then re, re, uh, take the ball against the head in the scrub. And I also think it's fair to say there's been a lot of disquiet uh, about referees' decisions, and there's been a lot made about the scrum uh, that Pollard kicked. Um, and and yeah, I've looked at that on on tape probably about fifteen times today. And and clearly for me, it's a penalty against Green Three. Peter Step du Toy, you know, you two are both back row players, and you know how to slip up the side of your your prop and into the ribs of the other prop. Peter Step du Toy does exactly that. Uh, Vincent Cock is, is at right angles. But the thing that people are missing is the three previous scrums, South Africa had completely legitimately trolled England, right? Yeah. So Ben O'Keefe has seen a picture. The moment he's rewarding the fourth scrum on the picture that he's seen in those previous three scrums. And yeah. I wouldn't want to be Ben O'Keefe in the pouring rain in Paris with 80,000 people whistling on me, five minutes to go in a World Cup semi-final, knowing that if I cock up, um, I'm just going to be pillaried. I mean, whichever way he'd have done it, he's yeah, he's, he's had a lot of heat. Um, which I think is a great shame because I think up until the French game, he'd had an outstanding tournament. Um, I think he has made some errors. Um, but that's the nature of the game. We we all know. Um, and it's a salient lesson. Um, and it's something that we always must remember in rugby. Everything that goes against you, you've got 79 minutes in the game to turn that around. You know, so just relying on one minute of the game and saying, well, that went against us. We've had 79 minutes to change the fate of our own side. So at the end of the day, I think um, two great sides are in the final. Whether or not I think they're the two best, I'm not quite sure, but they're not far off it. They're certainly in the top four. Yeah. One of the sides that's not in the final, and I just want to touch on them briefly, Chris, is Ireland. I mean, that game against the All Blacks, it was a flip of a coin, wasn't it? It legit could have gone either way. Yeah, it was It was a brilliant game. The two quarterfinals in Paris, that and the Savaka France, were some of the best rugby games I think I've ever seen. And with both of those teams, it was always going to be a flick of a coin. Neither side was going to run away with it. And you would have had your arguments if New Zealand had lost and, and vice versa. So, and I think it's really important. I was at the stadium and I saw some of the New Zealand or former New Zealand players and they, their big mindset in a week going into that game was, we don't have to beat Ireland 10 out of 10 games. We just have to be the best side in the world for one day. And that was their whole mindset in a the week. They, they were preparing to be the best side in the world on Saturday. And everything they did was at their best. If they played Ireland 10 times out of 10, would they win? Mm, probably not. But on that day, in those conditions, 
And I think also subconsciously, Ireland and that quarterfinal tag on social media all week was them losing in quarterfinals. New Zealand, the opposite. New Zealand going in as underdogs is a. It's brilliant when you're an underdog because there's no pressure on you, there's no fear, you can go out there and play. And that's exactly what New Zealand did. And of course, you, you end up, you get the rubber, the green, the ball bounces your way, and it builds confidence. But they took their tries extremely well. And, and what really impressed me, it's a phenomenal stat that they didn't make one hand in error in that game, given Ireland the scrum, yeah. which, which is madness. So all of a sudden, you're taking that threat, which again, they're probably better than New Zealand are in kind of that kind of that scrummage and taking your legs away. Um, so you're working to your favour like that. I think yeah, um, I, you go, James. Yeah, I, I, Chris, I absolutely agree with everything you said there. And I think the other little factor has been the turning over of Leinster by La Rochelle in two successive European finals. Um, and I think that that's just another thing that's been very erosive of their confidence in terms of, of closing those uh, really tight games out. Um, and, and, you know, as as whilst you guys made the point about winning habits for the spring box, sometimes when you get to those close games and you've kept losing them, that can also become habitual. Mm. Um, and I think perhaps Ireland have just struggled really to close off those big games, you know, and... I don't want to be cliched and say, uh, but but it's a point of, of truth that 17 of the Irish starting 23 are Leinster players, and they take that onto the field with them. But I think it is a huge shame. <clears throat> For me, Ireland played, I mean, them and France played some incredible rugby in this tournament. And it's, it's almost a shame they didn't get further. Because I think both of those games could have been fitting semi-finals as well. Um, and you look at the quality of them, the way they beat South Africa, the way they beat Scotland, and then that game as well was a classic in itself. So, um, but unfortunately, someone always has to lose. Yeah. So, Jim, what did you make of Argentina? I'm oh, sorry, because they looked, they looked, yeah, yeah. Argentina looked after their first game in the pool like, wow, what is wrong with this side? And then they go all the yeah. way to the semi final, the way they go out, they're not going to be happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, the, it was really strange the campaign of the, the RGs because they they started they started the first game against England where where, where, where I don't know we, we everyone just asked what's happened with this team uh, uh, was massive credit because England play played a perfect game with the take a red car uh, for it was great uh, that that night but but in terms of what uh, Argentina produced during the pool stage game was you know a little bit disappointing uh, they. Lost against England, they struggling uh, winning the game against Samoa, and uh, what put like big, big, massive uh, difference between between them and Chile. But uh, even against Japan, they they you know they, they don't really control the game, uh, and they still winning. And and finally, they they get in the current final against Wales, which was you know a, a hard game. But you know the, the Argentinian players is you know it's every time inside they use you you know that they never give up. They're gonna fight they're gonna be physical they're gonna and if you see in terms of what they produce uh, in attack uh what they play is was was not great what we saw uh in their game was nothing really really uh you know uh we say wow what a game it's just you know, good set piece defense uh doing simple things and um actually i i expect be uh, a, a better game against new zealand actually i was you know when when say the game New Zealand against Argentina before that game, I was a little bit worried about how New Zealand uh, will approach that game because um, it was the first time where we never we don't talk about how uh, the All Blacks the All Blacks were underdog before the World before the World Cup. Everyone took up of Ireland, South Africa, and France. And actually, the first time I see the New Zealand players uh, emotionally be, be really happy after the games against Ireland when they won that game. You see the players that like, happy and you know, uh, and it was something that you never see, I never saw before in the New Zealand team. You got, New Zealand just, they just as I think Johnny Texan talked about it that you just they work up if they win or not don't win they work up. So you know what I mean. And actually they won the current final against Ireland. It looks like they won 
they won the, the World Cup and they, I think how they're going to approach the game Argentina uh, emotionally because actually they left a lot of energy and emotion in that game that was an incredible game. And, uh, you know, and, and the Argies, they start the first five, seven minutes of the game, they start well, they take the ball, they're doing simple things, they get the momentum and they were there. And in some sense, New Zealand just co try. they felt a little bit like, uh, you know, they control actually the, the game quite, you know, very very quickly on the uh, and actually the Argy field without no no not so many threats not so many you know danger put danger on this New Zealand defense and was actually an, an easy game for for them and uh, and allowed them to manage some energy for the final and uh, they doing some coaching uh, quickly on the game they played on Friday so probably for them it's going to be an extra uh, day to recover from the final so. You know, for me, they are they are, they are the favorites for the final, but it's gonna be it's gonna be a great game against South Africa. Yeah. Here in New Zealand, people are most angry that Richie Moonga didn't pass that last that last pass to Will <laughs> Jordan, so he would have broken like the try scoring record for rugby world cups. Yeah. But if that's the biggest thing to complain about, it's not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, hold on, Will Jordan can complain as much as he wants, but I was dead level with the surveyor pass for that seventy meter try. And it was at least at least a meter forward. I'm telling you. Yeah, it looked forward as well <laughs> from the from the camera angle on the top. Yeah. yeah. But while you're just on New Zealand, Mark, uh, Sam Kane, I think um, Sam Kane's biggest crime in rugby has been that he isn't Richie McCourt, and I think mm -hmm. in this uh, tournament he's really come into his own. I don't think anybody hits harder in the tackle uh, than Sam Kane, uh, and I think his leadership, the way he's conducted himself, the way he speaks. Uh, he's he's a real leader to me, and somebody I, I really uh, enjoy uh, having FaceTime with when I interview him. Real top guy. Especially when you see the New Zealand team, when you see this New Zealand team, and you see how 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 many players with that huge experience they have. So you think about Sam Whitelock, uh, Aaron Smith, uh, Brody Retali, uh Plenty of players. They have massive, massive mm -hmm. experience in their shoulders and. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, and I think Robert talked before that. Imagine like Ian Foster as coach, like winning the World Cup, <laughs> and 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 get fired. <laughs> the next Monday oh, will be, yeah, Monday will be great. Will be mad. Yeah. yeah, he's certainly got some experience in that squad. Um, just before we get to the final, the English squad, Chris, is is one that's got a few senior guys in it as well, but a lot of young players. And, um, you know, in the World Cup where they weren't, like you said earlier, they weren't predicted to do much of anything. The fact that they were that close to getting to a World Cup final surely speaks well to the future of how the game's going over there. Yeah, it does. I think, um, yes, the, the young guys came in, Freddie Stewart and stuff was brilliant under the high ball in those conditions. But I think the experienced guys really stepped up. You look at the likes of Joe Marler and Dan Cole, or all the front row, Mara Toje looks like he's back to his best. Um, Courtney Laws as well, Owen Farrell delivering, um, and then the kind of the back three, the wingers are chasing. I, I say that the centres were obviously very quiet from both sides. I don't think they touched the ball too much, to be honest. Um, but for a man with England, I think they were they were brilliant. I think unfortunately, they probably just lost the battle of the benches. I think the benches from South Africa came on, added a little bit more of an impact, and. Um, from an English point of view, we got off to the perfect start. Early penalties, turned them over when they went to the corner and stuff like that. Uh, a bounce of the ball here and there. The conditions went our way. But our players seem to really, really grow. And it's something they haven't done too much. They've had moments throughout the tournament. And the odd players played well here and there. But as a collective, I thought they were all, all stood up yesterday. It's, um, you know, they always say, coaches will always tell you, and Sergio, you know, uh, you can probably endorse this, that attack is, is the last thing you bolt on to a side, okay? What England have is almost three legs of the table now. They've got great defence, they've got great set-piece, very competitive at the breakdown. The last table leg, that's going to be uh, the attack. And I think had Marcus Smith played, or I don't think he would have played in that game, um, but had they've had him coming off the bench, I think... Uh, that might have uh, moved it in our favour. But one player I do want to sit, uh, shout out is George Martin. Uh, there's very few players that have impressed me as much as George Martin from the first time I laid eyes on him at Tigers. And he's one of these hybrid lock sixes. Um, and obviously, 
Chris, you, I'm sure you back this up. He's the obvious heir to Courtney Laws's thrown on the blindside flank. You know, he's built for that job, either playing as a lock, but predominantly at six. But the story I love about him is um, he got called into the England side during the Six Nations or during the war tests at a very, very late stage when I think Courtney pulled out or somebody pulled out. And apparently uh, Tigers had got a game uh, a weekend off and uh, George Martin and his mates had gone to Cheltenham races for a few beers. And Steve Borthwick called him at about three or four o'clock in the afternoon say, look, George, I need you to come across the England. And he was absolutely, he'd had a few. And it, he picked up the phone, saw it was Borthwick, and his opening line was, right, boss, who do you want me to melt? Who do you want me to fold? Just tell me, I'll be there. And I just loved it. And that's exactly what he did all day yesterday. He just melted people in the tackle. And he, the, the one on Mustard, when he just absolutely, I mean, Mustard is such a physical player. And he just melted Mustard, ripped the ball off him. Wow. This is a kid who's 21 years old. Uh, and I actually think we've got a potential 100 cap of there with England. I think this guy's incredible. Yeah. It was a huge effort from a lot of the English boys uh, last night. It was, it was incredible to see how physical they was against South Africa. And then, you know, every time, as Robert said, like Freddie Stewart was incredible uh, uh, um you know uh, on the high balls it was a, a difficult a difficult game to manage and and um and you know even if the if the springbok uh bench made the difference second half the thing that particularly i was surprised is how when they scored the try south africa scored a try they have the line out in the england 22 that everyone expect them to drive you know and they go yeah. with the doing like a drummy drive which uh you know, surprise probably they be the, the English defense and actually like Snyman going around the corner and score like it quite easy was really easy because they gave the momentum was really diff easy to score and 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 as you, you know, how as you say like the scrum in the last scrum was probably difficult to 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 get a whistle for for Ben because as you say um completely I'm I'm not a scrum <laughs> I don't want to you know uh give less on the scrum for the props i don't want to you know <laughs> talk about it but actually yeah, yeah like coach look coach look really really across and uh, and as you say probably was a penalty against against south africa but because they really dominated the three scrum before uh they had his picture and his head and was you know easy to to make to make a decision but for him you know he's 34 years old i think okay as coach uh, uh sorry referees it's a very young referee and uh carry final semi-final both uh close game uh winning by one point so of course he made errors uh against france probably as well but you know uh it's not it's not a, a an easy position to be and i think he for him as well i hear a, a lot of um you know the hate on him about the french support there's a lot of people in the social media which is you know, in some stage we must see. Okay, it's it's a rugby game. It's frustration. It's it's normal. But we all we are human being. Uh, human being. We we made mistakes. Uh, players, coaches, and referees, of course. So uh, we must be trying to protect as well uh, everyone who is part of the game. Um, I was the first that sometimes be frustrated against referees, and 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 you know I don't gonna be you know lied. But I think sometimes we must do, you know uh, trying to protect. The, all the all the person we are part of the game and frustration is normal but i think he received a lot of uh you know lots of pressure a lot of hate especially <laughs> from the french uh from the french side after that game against against south africa um, i totally agree with all of that and i think one of the things um that i was hearing in the week chris and this won't surprise you uh, a lot, uh, Steve Borthwick said they started really thinking about it on Tuesday, but two of the loudest voices from an emotional perspective were Joe Marler and Dan Cole talking about their last dance together. Um, and, you know, they've got the best, one of the best bromances in rugby, those two. You know, it is Laurel and Hardy. Well, it's probably uh, Hardy and Hardy, actually. But, but <laughs> And um, just hearing um, what Borthwick, well, Richard Wigglesworth told us at the presser, on Friday just said how well both Joe and Dan had talked about how important it was for them. Um, maybe to put to bed the ghosts of 2019 scrums um, and do something very special together. Uh, you know Joe a lot better than I do. Um, you know, how would he react to that? Yeah, he was um, 
obviously, of course, hugely down. And I think every English forward in particular after that 2019 game was was devastated because everyone put, put the pin on them and, and blamed them for that. And South Africa were brilliant that day in the forward pack. And I know Joe can be a, a bit of a joker and a bit of a character, but when he's in the rugby environment, he is extremely intense. He's an emotional man. Um, and same as Dan Cole. Dan Cole's a very quiet guy off the field. Um, but when he's comfortable in there and he trusts the people around him, and a huge amount of this England squad has started from kind of twenty post-2011 World Cup, really. Some yeah. played 2011 World Cup. But a lot kind of started that journey 10-plus years ago. So the bonds you form, and Sergio's been in the change room, you get so close. You, you spend more time together than these guys have been together now for, for five and a half months. More than obviously they spent with their families, the kids, and all that kind of stuff. And and those kind of bonds really kind of at this stage of the tournament become really important. And it's often more powerful when players who because Coley doesn't often speak emotionally or anything like that to the group. He'll speak around his friends. Be, he might be quite quiet. So when people like that speak, it becomes really, really powerful. Well, I think um, I think they both put in um, the more uh, memorable performances, and uh, you oh, know brilliant. that relationship you talked from 2011, uh, Chris. Believe it or not, for us as as journalists, you know what we call the hardcore of the English journalists. We also build those relationships with the players and we know them and little in jokes start to emerge and i know i'll miss um the likes of dan joe uh, danny care particularly great bloke uh, and courtney absolutely immensely they're great guys we better get to the final all blacks spring box it's maybe not the final that all the neutrals wanted because it's the two bloody teams who've won it three times a piece so it's the battle mm -hmm. for who's going to get this kind of fourth trophy. Sergio, it sounded earlier like you were maybe leaning towards the All Blacks a little bit. What if it's raining? I've seen the long-range forecast for Paris is maybe for yeah. a little bit of rain. Do you think that could even things up? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, it's disappointing. No, no, no team is very team on the final. <laughs> but, uh, of course, like both teams, uh, they deserve to be there. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, Paris, I think, probably is going to be wet. And... Uh, um you know uh, i think new zealand new zealand uh i think we, we arrived this final with a lot of uh energy i think they they you know it's was incredible how you know they their campaign during the world cup uh, everything around the team and south africa you know was from from the first game of the of the world cup was a favorite to arrive in the final and um you know uh it's gonna be you know, last night England, the game plan for England was great. Sorry, back to to to, to England, but uh, they they put a lot of pressure uh, on the air. Uh, South Africa really struggling uh, on the uh, on the kicking game of England, and and probably probably New Zealand is gonna show that and, and prepare, you know, their final to try to you know put pressure on the South African team. But I think they have they have New Zealand have all all the weapons to, to win this 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 final i don't think it's going to be easy of course not because the final is going to be a close game but uh in terms of uh i think new zealand probably going to be a little bit of pressure uh to do uh, this final and um it's going to be interesting to see how south africa are going to manage as well this this final how it's going to be their tactic for this game if they're going to still uh bringing you know a 5-3 on the bench as they do in the last two games so they're going to try to change and probably put some you know another big guys on the on the bench um as well so it's going to be interesting but i think like you know new zealand new zealand for me personally is going to be favorite to to win the final how about for you chris the experience of the south africans most of these guys have won a world cup before but the new zealanders like sergio says an extra day's rest maybe not quite the same amount of emotional toll given their semi-final was a lot more you know kind of one-sided yeah i think that's going to play a huge part um look they took a lot of their older guys off their better players off after 50 minutes and the difference between playing a 50 minute game and an 80 minute game and extra day of rest does add a lot um, you could see the South African guys look tired. They look beaten up after that French game a little bit. and But they'll get a huge amount of confidence and, and having a proper week to recover. 
But I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna go the opposite. I'll go for South Africa. I, uh, I think back to that game at Twickenham, where I've not seen a South African team as prolific with ball in hand. Um, and I think South Africa, I imagine they'll play Pollard at ten. You would have thought the way him and Faf came on. I, I think that tactic worked well in the France game, but I think they probably needed both those players at the beginning of the game. And I, I would think they would come in and try and really control that. And then they do what they do, and they, they build a score that goes three, six, nine, twelve, maybe get a try. Um, but look, I think we're set for a classic. Um, and again, it's going to be a flick of a coin. They're both quality sides. Both one might win one day or another day, and it's who deals with the pressure. And I think you look at most of their squads, and I think New Zealand pretty much have a fully fit squad from the start of the tournament, which is... I know South Africa have lost one or two, but generally that's pretty a pretty good squad considering the, the intensity of games they've played. Um, but I think a lot of this week will be body maintenance and that mental side. Yeah. Well, James, it's down to you then. They've got one call in it for the All Blacks and one call in it for South Africa. Well, well, you've got one as well, but I know which way you're going. I mean, the way you've kitted out today, I noticed you've been dusting those out in the attic. You've kept those till the exactly. uh, to the final week. I can see that. That's it. I think, uh, look, um, I think the All Blacks will do it, and I'll give you a few reasons why. Uh, the game against um, uh, South Africa at Twickenham, um, sometimes things happen like that, but I think uh, the All Blacks with Geordie Barrett at 12, uh, Shannon Frizzell, at uh at six and tyrell lomax at three if you remember he went off with a cut leg after about 18 minutes at twickenham i think we're a different proposition but i also think that there's a little bit of the rub of the green and i think sometimes you run out of that rub of the green and i think look i don't want to sound bitter because i wanted either you know i wanted france to win the world cup and i wanted england to do well no, as Africa have, have seen both of those off. But I think in both of those games, South Africa have had a little bit of the rub of the green. And, and that's not to denude anything they've done because you ride your own luck, you make your own luck, they're champions and so on. But the two things, there's two things that uh, New Zealand uh, need to do. One, simple, use the firepower they've got because their superpower is they can score a lot of points. I'm not sure the Springboks can do that. But the big thing that they need to do that both France and England cocked up is they need to speak to both of their starting props and say, boys, you're going to have to give it all today. You're going to have to empty the tank because it, there's one synergy between England, France and New Zealand. And that is the drop off between the starting scrummages and the finishing scrummages in the games we've seen has been absolutely monumental. And so, Joe, you know that I asked you when I was writing my uh, piece yeah. in the lead up to the France game, I said, what's the scrimmage differential between Bayer and Wardy and Antonio and Alguideri? And you replied and you said, well, yeah. they are very much the number ones. So I, I think, you know, if I, if I were in Foster, I'd be talking to Tyrell Lomax, Ethan DeGroote, and say, boys, you are going to be a lot of pasta this week. You've got to go deep, you know? You, we need 70 minutes yeah. out of you because quietly under the radar, one guy has turned both the quarter final and the semi final, and that's Oxley Shea. You can talk about everything else that's gone in the game, but that is the guy that has put South Africa in the final because he's come on and trolled two, two reserve tri tight heads. Yeah. Well, either way. Hopefully it's a cracking game from a personal point of view from New Zealand. It'd be great to see Ian Foster after all the stick that he's gotten from the media over here, you know, to walk away as a champion. But I know Ninaba is leaving his role with South Africa as well. So uh, it'd be pretty special for the Springboks to go back to back. But um, yeah, thank you guys so much for your time. Once again, we look forward to the final. This broadcast has been brought to you by Itoro, the official investing and trading partner of Premiership Rugby. Tackle investing the smart way and join millions of UK investors on Itoro today, the friendly platform for serious investors. Itoro is a multi-asset investment platform. The value of your investments may go up or down. Your capital is at risk. Sergio, thank you. Chris, thank you. And James, thank, thank you. you so much. Enjoy the final. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.